Hold on one second, everybody. I got to get recording going. I mean, you don't have to record me if you don't want. <laughs> Ellie, yes, I do. Dr. Sumner, I noticed on the live stream, if you go to it, there's actually like a recording of at least before the lunch break, there was a whole recording of everything that we had done so far. Oh, really? There too. So it might automatically do it as well. I think it's doing it because I'm having it automatically upload into Google Drive. Okay. So yeah. I think it's showing that because I think your mom tried to email me and get access to it. <laughs> Probably. I was like, who's Clark? I'm like, no, that's, I bet that's Lexi's mom. So that, that's, um, everyone will probably have access to that recording then after I'll make sure that everyone has access to it. So you can watch yourself over and over and over again. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's start with our third and final panel of the day, Economies of Exploitation in Colonial Latin America. All right, we're going to begin with Ellie Porter, who's going to present the contradictory nature of African slavery in Brazil. Okay, so my presentation is on the contradictory nature of African slavery in Brazil, specifically between the years of 1550 and 1800. I found this topic fascinating because these African slaves living in Brazil were given the right to practice Christian traditions, yet were still not giving their much deserved freedoms. So some research questions that I looked at to help guide my research were, what were the differing views on African slavery in Brazil and how are they justified? Followed by how were Christian traditions impactful for the life of an African slave? And why was slave marriage so beneficial to slave women living in Brazil? And the order of my presentation, we're going to first begin by looking at my historiography, focusing on the early 20th century, the mid 20th century, and then the late 20th century to modern times, followed by my historical background. And then we will explore the Christian rights that were practiced by African slaves and the divergent views held by the clergy members. And then we'll finish by looking at my conclusion and what happened next. So for my thesis, I put, although many slaves participated in marriage, had families, communal structures, and were baptized, the Portuguese living in Brazil were socialized to believe that African slaves were subhuman due to their historical contact with the Muslim Moors on the Iberian Peninsula their deeply and their deeply entrenched racism with people of African descent. Slave owners allowed these things, such as marriage, to further their own Christian agendas. The evidence for this can be seen in the capture of the slaves in the continent of Africa, the dehumanization that took place on the transatlantic journey to Brazil, and the lack of basic human rights within continental Brazil. So I divided my histori historiography up by time because as ideas of racism have evolved, so have historical sources about slavery in Brazil. So to start... In the 1900s, historians such as Jane Elizabeth Adams write that Brazil would never recover economically if slavery was ever abolished. She furthered her argument by discussing how reliant the country of Brazil was on agricultural exports. Many authors also focused on, on how Africans were more physically fit than their indigenous or white counterparts. They also heavily relied on pseudoscience. So if you look at the picture on the bottom right hand of the screen, um, there was much of these diagrams, which clearly are not true, to justify slavery in Brazil. And then moving to the 1930s to the 1950s, historians such as J.K. Eads used extremely racist and culturally insensitive terms to describe African slavery in Brazil in their writings. The view of African people being unequal to people who phenotypically look different than they did became extremely apparent in these texts. The labor shortage became even more evident as the most important theme. And then the historiography from the 1950s to 1990. By the 1950s until the 1990s, many historians engaged in comparative slavery. Carl Degler specifically argued that Brazilian slaves were more rebellious than their American counterparts. However, the racially insensitive terms began to decrease at this time because now many historians viewed slavery as a crime against humanity. And in the pictures I included on this slide, I made sure that they had like the tools that they would use to actually harvest the sugar cane. 
because this was one reason why they said that slaves in Brazil were more dangerous and more rebellious is because of the tools they used were so dangerous looking, but it was the tools that they had to use to physically harvest the sugar cane. And then by the turn of the 21st century to present, the modern conversation surrounding African slavery in Brazil has transformed. People now research kinship networks, ritual god parentage, and marriage much more frequently. These sources also show the racism that, Portu that the Portuguese had against their African slaves. These texts also show how the Portuguese believed if the Africans were Christian, they would better themselves, and that it was much easier for them to enslave Afri African Muslims than say indigenous Christians or indigenous, I mean, or white Christians. So to follow with my historical background, the medieval Iberian Peninsula was highly militarized and hierarchical. By 1492, the Muslim Moors were expelled from Spain and Portugal. This created the belief of that Africans were subhuman and this created the deeply entrenched racism. Also, when the Portuguese arrived in Brazil, there was a lack of a major civilization such as the Aztecs or the Incas. So there was not the indigenous labor force as found in Mexico. So they had to turn elsewhere to find slaves. So they turned to the continent of Africa. Slaves in Brazil were constantly needed because of the backbreaking labor of harvesting sugar. Sugar as a plant is also extremely time sensitive and from the time of harvest to the time that it is used is extremely important that it is done very quickly. So this became a cyclical need for workers and sugar was the main cash crop of Brazil during this time period. The first stages of dehumanization began in Africa on the trek to the ports. Slaves were constantly kept in a state of hunger and thirst to pre prevent them from rebelling or trying to run away. And if you look at the pictures, the bottom picture is of a slave boat, and that shows how crowded and lit like just the lack of humanity that was given to these people. So the divergent views in my paper, um, the Catholic Church heavily influenced the confusion amongst citizens living in Brazil. Because on one hand, you had Bartolome de las Casas, whose picture is on the bottom left of your screen. And his main argument surrounded the atrocities around slavery and how it should be abolished at all costs. And then on the complete contrast, you have Antonio Vieiras. He was extremely racist. He justified himself by saying that as long as you did not torture an African slave, it was a sin, but just merely owning someone of, that was indigenous was a sin. He also preached things such as the honor thy master Bible story to slaves rather than the Moses Exodus story. Antonio Mon Montesinos, in contrast, focused on converting slaves to Christianity and bettering them. This was kind of like what Johnny talked about with the mission and how, you know, they were overtly you know, baptizing and making these people Christian, but covertly, covertly, they were exploiting these slaves and using them for economic benefit. And the importance of Children of God's Fire is that it has many of the primary sources that detailed the trek through Africa to the coast, the arrival at the port, the transatlantic journey that followed, and their arrival in Brazil. This source was crucial to my research because it also had many accounts that, you, that detailed the daily lives of African slaves by outsiders and by people from Europe. So it was not so biased for the Portuguese. Um, and it contained the sermons that I just discussed by the Catholic priest. So some of the Christian rites practiced by African slaves were baptism and the participation in a slave family. Baptism was very important to the lives of African slaves. This began as early as the mid-17th century in Brazil. This was caused, caused by the Ordinacios Filipinos, which made it illegal not to baptize slaves. Being 
I, oh my gosh, it was a codified law book that made it illegal not to baptize slaves. It also provided that any slave that arrived after the age of 10 must be baptized by at least six months of their arrival in Brazil or it was illegal. Being baptized showed that slaves were capable of being saved from sin and through baptism they ridded the name of pagan from their identity. The term pagan was often used to negatively describe African slaves. And the contradiction with this is that if they are capable of participating in one of the most sacred aspects of Catholicism, they should have been freed much longer or much before they actually were. The slave family was important because it provided a reason for the slaves to want to survive. The African slave family provided medical care for each other. They participated in sustenance farming and provided food for each other. And it also provided them some social stability and an emotional out from their horrible lives having to harvest sugar cane. Much evidence points to highly structured families with older and younger children and parents living together. However, they often lived in extended family networks, which had aunts, uncles, grandparents, members of their ritual godparentage, and younger siblings all living together. If you look at the top picture, that is the, one of the most accurate pictures that I found of an African slave family living in Brazil. This all this put, provided emotional support for each other. Where this is one of the most important reasons for the African slave family. Other Christian rites that were practiced by them were ritual god parentage. Ritual god parentage was important because it created a kinship network that was much different from any genetic or biological network. This was also extremely important through the eyes of the Catholic Church. The tradition of ritual god parentage was seen in the codified law, law book, the Constitucios Primeras de Arcebispado de Bahia. And this was extremely important because this also was a way that African slaves living in Brazil kept their African traditions alive because through this, elder Africans would mentor younger Africans. And so, of course, songs and cooking and things like that were passed down through this relationship. So it was it was much bigger than just something that they were forced to do. And this also is another major contradiction because they if they were allowed to participate in such an intimate Catholic tradition, but they still were not given their freedoms they deserved. Marriage is extremely important because although it provided a sacred relationship between two people, it also saved young girls from sexual harassment and rape. This and also another part of the marriage that was important was they could not separate married couples. So this often led to rushed marriages where people would just get married so they could they would not be separated by the owners and sold to different plantations. Um, this also saved young girls from sexual harassment and rape. And, and during the 1750s, little was done to protect slave girls and women from rape. They did not have the option to deny intercourse or deny sexual acts with their owners. Slave owners' wives would often become jealous of their relationship that, the slave, that some of the slave girls had with the owners and the attention that the owners would give the slave girls. And the wife would often become extremely jealous and would torture these slave girls who had no option but to submit to the owner and would often give them contusions, would give them genital mutilations, would burn them and would literally torture them. Um, so this was something that often that marriage saved them from because the slave owners could no longer rape these people if they were in a legitimate Catholic marriage, which they were. And fertility was extremely important because not only did it give slave children, it gave the slaves children, but it also gave the slave owners, unfortunately, an easier way to obtain slaves and having to spend more money and buy them. So whereas this was a positive thing, it was unfortunately used negatively. And so for my conclusion and how things begin to change in Brazil, 
By the 1770s, views on African slavery began to change by the people living in Brazil. This first began in the urban areas where there was more news sources coming directly from Europe. And Europe at this time was calling for abolition of slavery. And so these impact of these Christian practices was very important because members of the urban areas saw slaves as equal to them because they were baptized. They did practice monogamous marriages. They all lived together. Like they practiced everything. They were baptized, all that. But members in rural areas were the ones who still were extremely racist and had many primordial arguments as to why slaves should not be given their much deserved freedom, which is why slavery in Brazil did not end until much later. But but like I said, by the 1770s, these views did begin to change. And this is where you start to see the writings of abolition in Brazil and the call for it from these people. And my, contrib- my contribution to the current discourse is that I hope that my research has explored more of the importance of African slaves participating in Christian traditions and how this began to change people's views on African slavery in Brazil and how they should have been given their freedom much before they they actually did. And then here's my bibliography. These are all of the secondary and primary sources that I used to formulate my research. And then are there any questions? Yay! I need like a clapping, like a sound, yeah. you know? Wait, yeah, Elliot, we can see you, yeah. Uh, okay, I can see y'all now. I'm, okay, good. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Questions for Ellie, please. Dr. Harris won't have any, so. Well, before he gets in there, Ellie, I'm going <laughs> to uh, I'm going to beat him to the punch because I know Wait. he probably has a lot, but and they're a lot smarter than mine will be, but. Um, <laughs> This idea, Ellie, that um, the Christian teachings uh, spared these families from being split up and these girls from being tortured and raped and these sorts of things. Um, Were those teachings backed up by laws or the courts or were those teachings... Are we talking about just people abiding by the teachings of the Catholic Church here or... Is there going to be a system in place that if a master decides to sell the wife to, you know, on the slave market, that that there was some kind of legal something or other that would step in and, and block that? Yeah. Um, for the most, they were Catholic laws, like, they were put in place. So I guess in that sense, they were forced to follow them if they, I guess, took their Catholicism seriously. I mean, obviously, you have the exception for everything. Sure. But I think for the most part, because they were engaged in legitimate Catholic marriages, that the slave owners saw that as being more sinful than, say, torturing slaves or things of that nature. Does that answer your question, or do you want me to, like... No, it does. I I just, I guess I'm... I'm surprised at that. I, I, I just um, um, I didn't realize that that there was that level of respect for the institution of marriage when it was enjoyed by a slave couple versus a free couple. And that's just not something that I've seen or heard before in other contexts. Can I? piggyback on that, I guess, a little. Um, since Dr. Heiser pretended like I might have a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the thing I'm, I'm seeing, I'm asking with that same general idea is the difference between church professions and church protections, right? That if you are a Christian, therefore you have certain protections and certain privileges. Um, when it comes to marriage, who's who's granting them the permission to be married? Is this something done by the church or is this something that the slave masters actually have control of in Brazil? Um, because if, again, if, if I can only 
do certain things to my slaves if they are not married, then, uh, and, but I have the power to not allow them to get right. married. Right. Um, you know, those are the questions that you would you'd be wanting to, to understand, I guess. Yeah, that was like yet another contradiction that I found was slave owners obviously could, I mean, they had the right to tell them yes or no that you can get married, but they also saw it as them becoming more Catholic. So mm -hmm. they did not want to rid them, I guess, of being able to participate in that Catholic tradition. And like I said, you have exceptions for everything. But in that sense, I think they saw that as them like becoming more Catholic by participating in like the sanctity of marriage. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. But I think it is important to I mean, something we talked about. There's a lot of, um, and Dr. Harris is way more of an expert on this than I am, but at least in Brazil, you see some major clashes, right, between the church and slave owners, um, like big time. And um, over this very thing, right, mm -hmm. where like, of course, the church and, and in Brazil, especially when when sugar dominates for a couple of centuries, literally all you have are people living on plantations. Like, that's it. That is the only economic institution that exists in Brazil basically until the 19th century. So you, you have these conflicts between local leaders, one of which is the local plantation owner and the other is the parish priest. And so, and of course, caught in the crossfires are slaves themselves. And so this is, it's a constant problem. Um, and, and that's why when Ellie highlights the rise of um, urban descent as the rise of cities, happens in Brazil in the 19th and into the 20th century is really, really important because before this, right? And this is when I, when we talk about slavery in Brazil, I mean, it's like an entire giant country that was Brazil was South Carolina, right? Like the whole country. So I think it's right. really hard for us to wrap our minds around the extent to which slavery in the plantation system was so dominant, right, in Brazil. And I think what also, think, though, Harris, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> again, we gotta. It's when you bring up sugar. I mean, it's there's the church, and then there's the economics, right? And sugar yeah. dominates Brazil, so it's important when you think about these things. Um, when you talk about the role of the church and the power of the church and church doctrine and practices, um, you can't remove that from it. So that even when you talk about the importance of family, right, and that they want marriages and they want stable families the demographics of sugar means you want male slaves because those are the ones who are going to be working in these sugar fields and sugar plantations yeah. so if you have only predominantly men and very few women um you're going to have a very unstable situation in terms of of the family as well so you gotta i guess the question that, to keep in mind or the, to keep asking is the balance between um you know what the church would like to, to be the case and what the reality of of sugar plantations would, would dictate yeah. um which is as you said dr sumner with the movement towards urbanization then you might have a movement away from those same general dynamics that, that are in place Ellie, I have another question for you. Um, and it's something that you touched on at the beginning, and we've talked about this a lot over the course of your research. But so you you introduced the, the three priests at the beginning of your presentation, and you talk about all of the different ways that all the different stances towards slavery. But of course, there are mega, mega differences between indigenous slavery and African slavery. Mm -hmm. Could you talk specifically about the, there's a couple of sermons that we discussed in class and that you discussed in your paper about how they justified, right? We have to protect the indigenous peoples. They are innocent. They have to be converted. Mm -hmm. But the people of African descent should be converted, but also deserve to be enslaved. How did they justify that? Well, I would say that they justified it, like I said, through racism. Like I, I would argue that was the over, like the overt theme of how they justified it is because they had a system that was that deeply entrenched of like racism. And I would say that like the priests, for example, I guess argued that they could Christianize the indigenous before they could Christianize the African slaves. 
Mm-hmm. So, and I guess they saw them from like the foundation set of like the Muslim Moors, and they wrongly assumed that anyone of African descent was Muslim, therefore, like was not Catholic. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a huge, but the history there is a huge part of it. And remember the sermon that we read in which, is it Father Vieira? Is that, is it Father Vieira that gives the sermon about how like your souls will be saved? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Remember? He, Father Vieira is the one that mainly talks about how they could live a life of servitude on earth. But then when they go mm-hmm. to heaven, which is a, you know, these people don't understand heaven because they're not Christian. Um they would be like, no, they would no longer be slaves or in a relationship of servitude if they made it to heaven. But like right. I said, it was a strange idea for people who do not understand Christianity. Well, and pretty terrible to tell someone that like your soul is, your soul is still free, but you're a slave. Um, hard. It's hard to wrap your mind around something like that. Not if, ideal. If I can... If I can jump in, <laughs> Ellie. That that's part of the, the uh, that's part of the tension in my mind as I think about this um, this idea that that uh, that the Christ the the slaves engaging in Christian practices somehow softened the brutality. Is that what you're saying? Soften the brutality of it um, because what you what we just heard described by this this priest talking about the you know don't worry about it now you'll be free in heaven bit Mm -hmm. is just a grotesque perversion of the biblical message Mm -hmm. it's just grotesque and (laughs) it happened on the protestant side it happened on the catholic side and that just shows the twisted mind and how easy so 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 it just to me it's it's hard to grasp that if a person says okay these two people are married they're involved in a catholic marriage no Mm -hmm. big deal i guess for me i'm just thinking what did they do to get around that because when they're determined to get around it they're going to get around it in the same way that the the priest is saying don't worry about it slaves Mm -hmm. you know just hang in there when you die you'll be okay (laughs) um you know it's just it's just it's just sick um it's such a twisting and so help me to help me to put those things together if you can ellie <clears throat> okay so what you're asking me is how like marriage i guess made it made it less brutal for them is that what you're asking me just like like well, well what i'm what i'm asking you is how did how seriously did they actually take that such that it actually was a, a, mm-hmm. a real protection if you've got people running around saying other things that are twisting the biblical message so badly. Does, am I making that clear, Ellie? I'm sorry if I'm, if no, I'm, okay. I'm, I just want to say, I'll answer what I think you're asking is. <laughs> That's a good strategy. <laughs> I think for them, like, I think the pressure was on, I guess, for them to Christianize these people, I guess, to, to make them feel better about the heinous institution they were making them involved in Mm -hmm. and not that it made their slavery less brutal, but I can say there were multiple sources that I read that for slave girls, if they were married, the, like the data showed like the rapes and sexual assault went down for the particular people who were involved in marriage. And I think like Dr. Harris said earlier, obviously economics was the forerunner for all of these things, but I think to most of the sources that I looked at, especially primary sources, the impact of the Catholic church weighed very heavily on these people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely helped like with them getting married. Like I said, they thought they were Christianizing them and making them better people. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's how I would answer. Is that what you were asking? No. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm starting, you're helping me. So Thank you. I mean, I think that the Catholic Church does hold to very high views of marriage and family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I can, I, I'm beginning to see how they might be preaching something stupid on the, on the grounds of, you know, don't worry about it while you're a slave. Now you can die and then you'll be okay. My, on, on one hand, you're preaching that kind of nonsense. But on the other hand, the church does certainly hold to very high views of these institutions. and 
And I think too, okay. the, okay. I yeah. the slave owners were, you know, trying to save themselves from sin. And I think they saw this as like, oh, these are good things that we're doing, even okay. though we were mm -hmm. forcing see that to too. servitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you did. No, you did great. You did great. You're good. Just one little quick thing, because um, just on top of that, I mean, it, part of it is, again, the, the church as an institution or uh, as compared to the Christian or as the individual is what you, you're, you know, that's really the gap is, I think, uh, Dr. Heiser, that these slave masters believe that being a better or making their slaves Christians makes them better slaves here, right? right? So that there's a connection, even if you want to keep it on labor and, and economics and, and power in that sense, um, if you can get them to be better Christians and to uphold certain values that they think will make them more pliable, um, what you're selling them on is in the afterlife, but how you're using it in the current situation is one that um, if they're more willing to act properly, quote unquote, um, as Christian slaves, then it benefits you as a master as well. Indeed, it and is hypocritical. Right. Thank I mean, indeed, I think, Kaiser, <laughs> your point that it's such a such a grotesque right. institution that I think it's just something, and this is something that Ellie struggled with too, is like, okay, how do I talk about this? Right. Like <clears throat> how how do you study something that you can't believe happened? Right. So it's been a it's been a challenge, you know, Ellie, and I think Ellie, you've done a you've done a really good job rooting yourself in in your sources, which is exactly what you should have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Other comments for Ellie? Okay, Ellie, thank you so much. Yay! Yeah. Okay, we've got two more, everybody. And next, hold on to your britches. <laughs> <laughs> Put on your eye patches. <laughs> Get out the pirate hats. <laughs> <laughs> we have Thomas it's Roddy, aka T Rod, talking about the impact of piracy in Latin America, everyone. Um, it's present now, right? Sure. My screen. Is it working? Yay. Yep. Looking good. All right, um, so I'm Thomas Roddy. Um, I'd like to thank all the professors for taking the time out of their day to, you know, sit inside and again uh, and listen to my speech and on my uh, research. So um, I'm doing mine on the impact of piracy in Latin America. Um, what really interested me in this was when we were talking about learning about Sir Francis Drake and all pretty much the work that they did in Latin America during class. And so that kind of really bent my ear and you know, I was really sitting up in class that day listening. And so um, I enjoy being outside and on the water. And so a lot of that helped me um, kind of connect to this topic um, as I got deep into it. Um, so my research question is how is piracy impact? How has piracy impacted Latin America from the 1500s to the 1700s? And how was it stopped? Um, my thesis, um, England took advantage of Latin America for their access to ports as well as for their natural resources. In contrast to the general perception of pirates being autonomous, violent characters, I argue that the English government contracted these pirates as a source to plunder and disrupt Latin America. Because Queen Elizabeth uh, approved court orders allowing pirates to attack villages and ports in Latin America, the violence increased. These actions were justified by Queen Elizabeth allowing her navy to appear to be doing nothing wrong or illegal while simultaneously increasing violence and terror on sea and land. It's supposed to say land. Um, so when I got into my paper, some of my main ideas and things I realized was that um, England had a pretty good grip on a decent amount of trade, such as things like spices and things like that. But the one thing they were lacking was silver. Um, so natural resources like silver um, were a big, I guess, attention grabber for Queen Elizabeth um, and her and the other and the other imperial powers that were all trying to attain them at this time. Um, one big turning point that I found once I got you know pretty deep into my research was that. Um, a lot of the people going from England to Latin America on these voyages were going with the mindset of, you know, finding wealth, seeing what they can do, et cetera. But um, as other powers in the competition with Spain increased, 
um, Queen Elizabeth begins to get greedy. And for example, um, Queen Elizabeth killed one of her loyal leaders, which was Sir Walter Raleigh, after he failed to discover El Dorado. Um, she pretty much, he had gone on a couple voyages to Latin America for her. And on this particular one, she said, you know, go to El Dorado and bring back what you can. And he failed. He said he, he couldn't find El Dorado and he didn't bring anything back. And she was so, she, she killed him and made an example of him. And I believe this was a major turning point from how the pirates went from being, you know, well, we're going to sail over here and see if we can find, sail back, you know, to, okay, if we don't, you know, do what she wants, she's going to put our head on a table. Um, so some other main ideas, um, the execution of Sir Walter Raleigh influenced all of Queen Elizabeth's pirates to become more aggressive and violent as they did not want to be um, executed for returning empty handed. Um, once the demand for resources and trade began to climb um, to Queen Elizabeth's top priorities, so did violence and tension on the seas and in Latin Amer America. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the people that created these ships. And when you think of, you know, these pirate ships, it's not Pirates of the Caribbean with Jack Sparrow and all them. It's these were people that left their homes and these were very skilled blacksmiths. They were very skilled with woodworking, like carpenters, all that who could fix and be able to do anything on the ship that needed to be done instantly. I mean, there was no, there was no any leeway of, there was nobody on that boat that could not do a job that needed to be done. There was no one on there for the wrong reasons, meaning everybody on that boat had a specific purpose, whether you were fixing sails or ropes, you were do, always doing something. And I think that stands out a lot because a lot of people believe that these pirates were just drunks. They got on a boat and went and attacked people and, you know, arg, but they really weren't. They were very smart and intelligent people and hardworking people that left their homes to try and find a better living outside of England. Um, so this, um, the impact, this kind of, I like this map because it kind of shows the ways that they would come, they would leave England and almost every coastal area around South America is completely covered and at least was constantly being patrolled, whether, you know, Queen Elizabeth had ships constantly along coastal areas trying to atta attack ships leaving Latin America, any merchant ships, especially Spanish. They were constantly, you know, head to head trying to compete and get more wealth than the other. So they could eventually be the top imperial power, um, especially on the sea. Um, another thing was trade routes and going back to the carpenters, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this um, PowerPoint. But Sir Francis Drake, he had. Um, pretty much a problem with the Spanish Armada and he found out ways to that he could shallow make the hull on his boat shallower so that he could go in um, less water than the big boats that the Spanish Armada had so he was able to attack some Spanish ships attain everything from them and then before the rest of the other ships could get there he could just sail through the you know jetties and rocky areas that other boats couldn't so they could just cruise on by and get out you know unscathed compared to the big boats that could not um, and that really stood out to me because I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so this is Sir Francis Drake. He was a very successful and loyal leader for Queen Elizabeth. Um, he led voyages and attacks in Latin America all over the place from the Rio Grande all around. Um, he was very, very helpful, especially during the tobacco boom when in the 1600s during the tobacco boom. When when that took off, um, you could almost kind of it, it, it really changed and how they really needed a lot of indentured slaves to do all the work on the plantations during this time. So you can, it, it kind of changed the perspective a little bit. Um, he was also, like I was talking about earlier, he was very successful. He was successful in defeating the Spanish Armada who uh, at that time, that was a very big deal because they were, the tension was very tight between them as um, the demand for resources like silver all came to rise. Um, it made it very, I guess, I don't know. He made it, he made it, I don't know. I guess he kind of won the battle on the sea, kind of the big one. Um, they kind of made England become the top, top dog after defeating the Spanish Armada. Um, another person, Sir John Hawkins, he was another loyal leader to Queen Elizabeth. He led with Sir Francis Drake. Um, I have one of my primary sources um, is about Sir John Hawkins, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and in this primary source, it's got hand, uh, firsthand accounts of experiences they had when uh, Queen Elizabeth sent them on a voyage to Guinea to discover Guinea. Um, it talks about how they, they switch from patrolling around the coastal areas to actually going in and um, attacking villages and 
ports and stuff like that all around um, up and down the river, the Rio Grande. Um, and how he becomes a violent and aggressive leader after especially Sir Walter Raleigh was executed. He kind of, he amps it up a little bit as well. Um, so this is the primary source I was telling you about. And it's a tiny, tiny little book. I don't know how they got it. And you can barely even read what it says in it. It's crazy. But um, this book really did have actually a bunch of, once I finally could figure out how to read it, some very, very valuable information because it, it, it told me about how they would come up to villages and they would see 500 men, women, children, all in barely any clothes walking around with pretty much bow and arrows and had not near the technical technological um, advances that England did and people like Sir John Hawkins had. And so they essentially would just go in there and completely take advantage of them. And for one um, particular time, it says they went into a village that had about 1500 people and uh, they killed all the men and just kept the women and children and uh, burned the entire village to the ground um, just to set an example, I guess. And, you know, that's just really how violent it became. It became. Um, um, it talks about how also they went all up and down the Rio Grande attacking villages, um, doing the exact same thing, just getting anything they possibly could and then burning it to the ground. Um, uh, another primary source I have is called They Saw It Happen. And this book is just pretty much in a bunch of um, eyewitness accounts of things that of events that happened. Um, some very valuable information came out of here, like encounters with Sir Francis Drake at sea. Um, it gives me, it gave me both examples of violent and nonviolent encounters. Um, there was examples of, like I talked down here about um, Sir Francis Drake and Maserate. Um, Sir Francis Drake came along the side of their boat. It talks about how it was a foggy morning and uh, Maserat uh, thought that it was a, um, a Spanish ship and they called out and they said, is this a Spanish ship? And um, Sir Francis, or they replied and they said, yeah. And then once they got close, they realized it wasn't. And by that time it was too late and they had already pretty much taken over the ship. And uh, it talks about how Sir Francis Drake wasn't, he didn't kill anybody. He made them put all their weapons in the middle of the ship. And then just him and the captain, which was uh, Maserate, they went down into the bridge, which would be, I guess, you know, the captain's quarters at that time. And um, Sir Francis did talks, he wrote that essentially Sir Francis Drake gave him the deal of, you know, look, I can kill you and all your men and burn your ship to the ground and take everything. Or, you know, y'all can just give me everything you have on the boat and I'll let you go. And he was smart and that's the decision he made. And so he got to live to write about his experience with Sir Francis Drake. Um, but there's also encounters other that were very violent, such as, you know, the one where the Spanish Armada, um, that battle, of course, um, that took is it took up a good bit of this book is just all um i guess accounts of and different experiences of people that had that um another part that i really liked which is what i talked about a little bit about earlier was how he talks about how the ships had to change over time um when they first started making the voyages from england they had you know decent sized boats that would hold a good bit of people like a hundred people but then as soon as the demand and the tobacco boom and the tension rising with the Spanish, they Sir Francis Drake and Walter um, Rayleigh told the um, Queen Elizabeth that they needed bigger and better boats and that these boats needed to be, have better weapons, better protection, bigger sails, they need to be faster, all these different things to give them an advantage over the Spanish so that they could eventually, you know, prevail and be the best. Um, so I thought that was very interesting how it, you know, it kind of showed how, it went from, you know, oh, we're just going to Latin America. We're going to go, you know, see what we can get to. All right. This is kind of a war now with everyone and Latin America. Now we're out here fighting these ships, trying just to try to get to Latin America and then getting to Latin America, having to defend ourselves, leaving Latin America. And so it kind of turns into quite the cluster um, over time. Some of the secondary sources I looked at, um, this one's called Sovereignty of Revolution in the Iberian um, Atlantic by Jeremy Edelman. Um, this was very helpful towards the end of my paper um, because it talks about how after the tobacco boom and everything like that goes off, how organized and functional the labor systems in Latin America were and how they were using how pretty much how they were getting all the plantations and to function um, and what was comprised of all of them. It talks about all the numbers and percentages of how much profit they made from tobacco and 
all of that within 10, 15 years and how it trip it doubles from like 30 to 60 percent um, profit wise, um, especially with things like and then, it, yeah, like tobacco, sugar and rum. Um, so this was a very, very helpful book. Um, another secondary source that I used was Villains of All Nations by Marcus Redeker. Um, this explains some things, a lot of things that I never really thought about, like, you know, when we're sitting out here at battle with the Spanish and they blow up half our ship and we blow up half their ship, but their sinks first and there's people floating in the water. What happens to them? And in here it says, apparently, that they would treat them as if it was their own and, you know, help them, give them food, give them water, you know, shelter them until, I don't know, you know, believe that if you want. I don't really think that's so far i think that's a little far-fetched um looks good on paper but i don't know um and this also talks about how piracy allowed trade to flourish it explains how you know boats were constantly coming in and out with with more and more stuff you know just in and out in and out like latin america was like a walmart parking lot there was just so much going on there and so much moving around it just created a massive global trade system with all these different types of things being tobacco rum sugar and everything and um explains a lot how exactly how pirates weren't just drunk people um and this bottom one i wish it was up there but it says it says um how pirates were able to use the caribbean islands to hide from the spanish armada um this explained how they would like i was talking about earlier how they were able to adapt their boats to get into shallower water so they could skim across the skinnier water and like get away compared to the big boats that had to turn around or wait for the tide to come up until they could cross and then try to catch back up with them um so in conclusion, and part of my conclusion, um, I found that Queen Elizabeth set the bar a lot after executing Sir Walter Raleigh. This caused a, um, the increase in violence among pirates. This also caused them to be stained with the typical stereotype that they have today, being like, you know, the drunk, messy, nappy, long hair, beard, which, I mean, they did have, but they weren't, they were very intelligent people. Um, they weren't exactly who you think they are. They weren't Captain Jack Sparrow you know, um, and that greed created a lot of the violence and damage in Latin America after everyone started plundering for natural resources and trade opportunities and switched to slave trade and agricultural trading. After that switch, it kind of, you kind of see it, it starts booming. There's so much activity once it kind of switches to agricultural, especially stuff like that. Um, it just takes off. There's, there's, there was other pictures and maps all in these books. It just, it, it just looks like a, I don't even, it just looks like a figure eight and just of diff different color lines, just like that, going from England to Latin America, South, everything. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth was justifying her actions within Latin America with legal documents, which was an attempt to cover up her footsteps and make what they did in Latin America okay. So she essentially, there's in this They Saw It Happen book, this primary source, it talks about um, one successful voyage that uh, Sir John Norris had and he, he went, she sent him, I believe, to Brazil, um, and he returned with a bunch of wealth, and um, there's there's letters back and forth talk, you know, talking about wages and um, if he can be paid more and his crew be paid more since they were successful in looting um, Brazil. And so this also, I would say, added fuel to the fire to other pirates to say, you know, hey, if we go over here and do real well and we plunder and we get all this stuff, you know, maybe we can get paid more too. Um, um, and also that most of these people who are considered pirates were actually really talented workers who left England looking for a better life and income, not just to be drunk, violent characters, you know, that sailed around the sea and just, you know, got free rides up and down the, you know, all around the ocean. They were, they were working um, hard. Um, and this is my bib. <laughs> Yay! It's so weird just talking to your screen. It's yeah, so I didn't, weird. It's so weird that you can't see us. I agree. I know. It's it makes me so, so weird. And you can't see us laughing at your jokes. Like you I know, made that's an the analogy. To, you made an analogy to a Walmart parking lot, which was really, actually, really accurate. I thought uh, it was funny. <laughs> I was like, I was like super historically resonant. Yeah. And I'm not even being sarcastic. Okay. All right. Questions for Tomas.
Yeah. Thomas. Nobody. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dr. Heiser. Go ahead, Dr. Harris. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, good job. Uh, so I think what, what I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about, because um, you keep going to the idea that um, it's not the, the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? This idea that um, Captain Sparrow is not the real pirate of this yeah. period. <laughs> um, but just to emphasize a little bit, if you could, just how the link between um, Queen Elizabeth um, or these pirates in the state, right? Whether it's England or other states uh, in the sense that they're actually actively engaged in uh, essentially the formation of the Americas, right? That it, they're not simply random people floating around, as you said, doing what they choose to do, but are actually serving the purpose of uh, of England or other nation states during this period. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, what, what, sorry, could you ask that again? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I hate it, that. It like, well, I, never, I can never say it again. Like yeah. Hard. So basically, just just this idea that these pirates are actually working with um, Queen Elizabeth or with England or with other city, uh, other nation states. Just the role that these pirates are playing in the formation of the Americas. These balances of power, right? They're they're helping Queen Elizabeth, which is hurting other nations that are also trying to gain these footholds in, in the Caribbean or other parts of the Americas. Just yeah. what do you see there in terms of that? Um, a lot of that. It also talks. So, in uh, there's another book. I've got it right here. Um, the Atlantic <laughs> World by Thomas Benjamin. But it it talks about in here how as England kind of started becoming dominant in Spain, Spain was kind of sitting there like, okay, hold on, like they're they're coming full force. So Spain started colonizing and doing all that and started going inland and not just staying around the coast which I believe is kind of why, you know, so, and, you know, England followed suit. They were like, oh, well, Spain's doing that and they're getting everything Then we're going to do that and get everything. So I think that's also why you find in this little primary source, while they were going, you know, up and down the Rio Grande River inside of, you know, Latin America, not just around the coast. And so it, it, it kind of, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but it kind of shifts from we're going to attack these boats that are bringing all this wealth back from Latin America across the ocean to, well, now it's all there and we need to get there and get all of it. So it kind of goes from, you know, I guess kind of traveling back and forth to trying to settle and attain all of it while it, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really answering your question. Yeah, I'm no, you're good. It's just, just, just the idea that the, you say the we, right, that we're going to do these things. I think it's important to remember that these pirates are actually part of the we. They're part of Queen Elizabeth's, you know, force or power as opposed to, Simply being, you know, working on their own, doing what they what they want to do without any any kind of connections early on. So, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, Thomas, I think that's the real value of the work that you did is showing how pirates are not they're not autonomous. They're not rogue. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. and that's really, I think the. Oh no. I think we've lost our fearless leader for a moment. Yeah, I was like, I hope that's not my connection. <laughs> She's back. She's okay. back. Can you hear me? There it now is. We yes, ma'am. Okay. No, but they're but just that um, pirates are not autonomous figures. They're contractors. You know, they were contracted by governments, right? Right. And they so, were like Queen Elizabeth's Navy SEALs. Exactly. But that's exactly right. I mean, but that's really important because it's completely against what we understand pirates to be. Right, because yes, and that's the important contribution of your argument and your research, um, in in revealing those ties. Because you're totally right when England's like, wait a second, Spain found all the silver. We also want the silver. Yeah. Like that's how they get it, you know. Right, Thomas, you understand, don't you? That I'm looking at you. I know you're a guy who's a big into boats and the sea. And behind you are is a map of the Sea Islands, which, of course, is supposedly uh, the haunt of pirates. And so it all comes together for me as I'm looking at your the picture. 
uh, of you on the screen. Let me Pardon. ask you this. Let me ask you this, Thomas, because in, in some ways I see something else that's going on here. I don't know if you were able to maybe pick up on it, something I had not thought of before your presentation. But what's the bigger context for this pirate um, activity? What is happening? Is the piracy the, the, the center of the story? Is that, or is that on the fringes of the bigger story that's going on in um, the story of England and Spain? Um, I would say piracy had a pretty big impact. Um, I would say it was definitely one of the main, bigger elements because it talks about con constant battle between Sir Francis Drake and Spanish leaders. It talks about skirmishes all the time where they would follow each other all the way up into the Caribbean islands and then they would run into sandbars and the tide would drop. So you'd have a uh, hundred foot big A word sailboat on a sandbar and then another one right behind it and they would literally get off the boats and this is actually kind of like the pirates of the caribbean scene where he's running down the beach with all everyone behind that's what i thought of but they literally i mean that's what they did they literally got on sandbars and would fight and then the yeah. tide would come up and they would go on yeah. and then it, it talks about just i mean especially economically i would say piracy had a big impact because it brought in so much wealth for a mm -hmm. lot of people and countries i would say yeah, and you and and I think I want I think the thing that I would like for you to consider is the storyline that you gave us is that they started out with pirates and the pirates are chasing boats around the Atlantic initially um, under the hire of Elizabeth, but then eventually they figure out okay we can just go get it straight from the Spanish colonies. That would suggest to me that the Spanish are losing it and the English are gaining. <laughs> okay. That there's a that the pirates are having the effect of maturing the English side of the story while the Spanish side of the story is weakening. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, and, and the role the pirates play as kind of a barometer of the or fortunes of that larger war between Spain and England going on in the European continent. Interesting presentation. Thank you. I hope that was a good, interesting. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Could I ask just, I guess, one, one, I guess the, the trajectory of what you're describing is where Queen Elizabeth has that control, as, as Dr. Heiser said, um, the Spaniards are losing, but then later, once they become more, more independent, essentially, um, is that why, if we go back to the movie, right, the pirate's enemy is the British, it's not the Spaniards, uh -huh. right? So is it the sense that they are basically losing control of this group who ha has been benefiting them and then now trying to regain control? Or do you see any, any of that? Uh, or is that just beyond your, That's a good question. At? That's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. Um, huh. That is a good question, Dr. Yeah. Harris. That one stumped me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, Okay. No, just something uh, to think about. I'm, just, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that is a good question. That's a very good question. Well, I would surmise, and something to think about is that, like, as Dr. Heiser said, as Spain, like, is clearly on the way out in terms of their imperial status, and England increasingly takes over, especially the Caribbean. I mean, when they take over Jamaica and all these other places, right? And I'm, I imagine that there's a lot of conflicts between what the government wants them to do and what right, the people on the ground who are actually there, who are oftentimes had lived a life of piracy, I would imagine there were some conflicts that arose from that, right? right. I don't know for sure, but it's really interesting. Right. But also like, who wants to watch Pirates of the Caribbean with Spanish subtitles, you know? I mean, that, gosh, that would be yeah, terrible. This this <laughs> you guys all complain when I make you watch movies with subtitles. subtitles. Again? Again? <laughs> All right, more questions for Thomas. All right, is everyone still with us? Uh, Got to stay with us because we're concluding with a major, major, awesome presentation. Does, does everyone need a two-minute break? Can we keep going, or what do you think? I'm going to go. Okay, I let's finish this going. thing. Yeah, Let's do it. Yeah. All right, Leeson, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Okay, good. All right. So, to conclude for today, 
we've kind of jumped all around in time. Um, so today, now, today, to conclude, we have Lisa Horn, who's going to give a presentation on the exploitation of wealth at the hands of European colonial expansion. All right, can you see it? Yes. Yay. Okay, good. All right, so my presentation is the exploitation of wealth at the hands of European colonial expansion, and I'm Lisa Griffith Horn. Uh, so my research question is, upon the Spanish's arrival into Mexico, how and why did the intentions of Hernan Cortez shift from their initial intentions of spreading Christianity, and how did this impact native civilizations throughout Mexico? And going off of that, my thesis is when the Spanish came in contact with the Aztecs, it was evident that the Spanish's judgment of the native culture was clouded by their Eurocentric view of how society should be, as well as their desire for gold and silver. The Spanish were fueled by their deeply rooted Christian beliefs and the pursuit of wealth, power, and glory. In the historical literature, many important aspects about the native civilizations were often overlooked by the Europeans because of the Spanish's overwhelming desire for wealth. Many contemporary historians challenge the Eurocentric narrative by comparing Spanish accounts to native accounts. Comparing these accounts is the only way to truly understand why the Aztec Empire fell in 1521. So basically, um, I know that was a lot in two slides right there, but the reason I decided to kind of go and dive into the research regarding this topic was because a lot of the historical literature that I'm gonna get into later on in my presentation they all talk about how the Spanish came and conquered the Aztec Empire and how the Aztec Empire fell in 1521. But what I, what kind of interested me while I was reading through some of the historical literature is that most of these historians don't really focus on the exploitation of wealth and how it came into kind of glorifying to the Spanish crown. And in my opinion, I feel like it's the most important part of the conquest and because that's the overwhelming like driving force behind why the Spanish wanted to come into the new world that was already civilized. So I did my research on this and found some pretty interesting stuff. So in my historical background, there are three major parts that you need to really understand and the first that Serena kind of talked about earlier this morning is what inspired the conquest of Mexico, and it was the Reconquista. Um, the Reconquista was a, it took place over a 780, 780 year period between 722 AD and January 2nd, 1492. And it was a period of conflict between Christian and Muslim forces over the Iberian Peninsula. And the overarching goal was to rid the peninsula of non-Christian occupants to unite Iberia under Christianity and territories on the peninsula were taken by the Christian kingdoms of Portugal, Navarre, Castile, and Argon. And basically all this is significant to the conquest of Mexico because just like they wanted to unite Iberia under Christianity, they aimed to bring Christianity to the Americas and unite them under Christianity and ultimately to, ri to rid them of their polyistic religious beliefs. And as time passed during their time in Mexico, their goals of spreading Christianity were set aside due to their desires to exploit the wealth that the in indigenous, people own indigenous peoples owned, and that was ultimately to glorify the Spanish crown. So the second part of my historical background is, well, the last two parts of my historical background are about two major figures within the Spanish conquest. And without your understanding of these two major figures, really none of this really makes any sense. So the first person that you need to really get a good understanding about is Hernan Cortes. He was a Spanish conquistador who led the endeavors in Mexico to encounter the Aztec empire. He was born in Medellin, Spain in 1485 and died on December 2nd, 1547 in Castellejas de la Cuesta, Spain. And basically the plain name Cortez was highly respected in Spain. And one of my secondary sources, Camilla Townsend, gave it in one, of, in one of her chapters in her book. She said, the plain name Cortez was as highly respected in Spain as the name of Alexander in Macedonia 
or those of Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Scipio among the Romans. So that really just goes to show you that his illustrious lineage was present, and that's why they chose him to uh, lead the expeditions into Americas. And he left Spain at 19 years old to travel to Hispaniola, and then he left Hispaniola for Cuba, and then from Cuba, he led his expedition into Mexico. And this nomadic lifestyle shows that he was chasing something other than a new place to live. He was clearly trying to fulfill his desire to bring wealth, power, and glory to the Spanish crown. And the last part of my historical background that you really need to understand to get a full grasp on this whole entire, on my whole entire research is the Aztec Empire and the Emperor Montezuma. So the Aztec Empire was formed with the Triple Alliance of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan in 1428. And even before the Aztec Empire was formed, there were many civilizations like the Olmecs and the Toltecs that flourished in Mesoamerica. And they all had their religious and social differences. But what's, what's so significant about this is whenever the Triple Alliance occurred, it really made the first like religious and civil government in Mexico. They had never been there before because before it was just a bunch of nomadic tribes that resided in Mexico. So whenever with the Triple Alliance, it really just kind of brought a sense of unity into Mexico that wasn't there previously. So the formation of the Aztec Empire made it the strongest empire in the Americas before Cortes and his men arrived in 1519. And the Emperor Montezuma ruled from 1502 until his death in 1520. And he conquered surrounding tribes and added them to his empire and required them to pay tributes. And that's what made his empire so strong within Mexico. Um, the Emperor Montezuma was the strongest man in Mexico before Hernan Cortez infiltrated his great empire. So my historiography, um, Throughout history, Hernan Cortes has been glorified in various accounts for gaining control of Mexico from the Aztec Empire. And he did this, well, Matthew Restall was one of my main historians, but uh, a bunch of other historians that I've had in my secondary sources were Camilla Townsend, Hugh Thomas, Brian Jackson, Justin Lyons, and many others. But Matthew Restall is kind of my guy on my research. and. He published many different books titled The Seven Myths of Spanish Conquest, like Highland discussed earlier in her presentation. Uh, when Montezuma Met Cortez and The Conquistadors, a very short introduction. And in these, Restall does an exceptional job in displaying the complexities of the conquest, while also detailing the important aspects that have been left out of the accounts from older, non contemporary historians, like that of Bernal Diaz de Castillo. Castillo and other native accounts. I'll get into Bernal Diaz here in a little bit, but all of his works are essential to the formulation of the argument and aided in my research to truly portray how Hernan Cortez exploited the wealth from the Aztec Empire and how that in itself caused the empire to fall in 1521. Um, essentially, once it was apparent that these new areas were rich in precious metals, their goals of spreading Christianity to the indigenous people, indigenous peoples were quickly set aside due to their greedy tendencies. And that's kind of what these, these secondary historians in my research really discuss and hone in on. And that's kind of, that's what I wanted to also contribute and go in, go into an in-depth approach and really hone in on that one aspect of the Spanish conquest. So throughout my research, there are two main primary sources that were essential into the formulation of my argument. And the first is what I was talking about earlier, the conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz de Castillo. And this is the, this is the one primary source that discusses the Spanish account of the conquest of the Aztec Empire. And Bernal Diaz was a, he traveled alongside Cortez and basically wrote down everything from start to finish from the time they arrived in Veracruz in 1519, from the time the empire fell in 1521, and from the time Cortez left 
Mexico after he conquered the Aztec Empire and went back to Spain. So this has really been an important source to kind of formulate my argument and to really make all of this make sense and to really truly understand how he himself exploited the wealth from the Aztec Empire to glorify the crown. Um, my second primary source that I'm highlighting in my presentation is the Broken Spears, which is the Aztec account of the conquest of Mexico by M Miguel Leon Portilla. And what's essential to know whenever I'm highlighting both of these sources is that they both ha they both tell the same start to finish when the Spanish came and all of the events that occurred from start to finish. But that you whenever you read both of them you can truly understand you can you get the true truly understand the differences between both accounts like the account the differences in the accounts of the spanish and the differences in the accounts of the natives and how they both viewed the events that were transpiring before their eyes so and all these events that kind of that happened really helped me formulate my argument on how they exploited the wealth so the first major talking point to my argument surrounds all the controversies that came with Hernan Cortez himself. Um, Cortez was picked to lead the Spanish expedition because he knew he knew how to command and inspire fear. He was picked by Governor Diego Velasquez of Cuba to lead the expedition, and the simple notion that he was chosen because to because he knew how to command and inspire fear truly shows the true intentions of the Spanish crown in their endeavors through Mexico. They didn't want this to be some cordial encounter. Being a, Cortez, de, okay, Francisco Hernandez de Cordoba and Juan Grijalva, they, before Cortez made his initial expedition, they um, did, they conducted expeditions into Mexico and reported what they saw with the indigenous peoples and that they contain massive amounts of wealth. But Cortez himself denounced these previous accounts by Cordova and Grijalva simply because he was trying to prove that he would be more successful in bringing wealth, power, and glory to the Spanish crown. And that's another major controversy that surrounded Hernan Cortez. And lastly, Governor Velasquez of Cuba before Cortez set out on his expedition to Mexico. He ordered that Cortez pause his expedition to Cuba before departing to Mexico. And he was, Velasquez was really fearful that Cortez would betray him. Essentially, Cortez ignored the order and, uh, un, and unlawfully set sail anyway so he could make contact with the civilizations in Mexico and export their wealth for his own personal gain to obtain glory. His deceptive personality came into play when he sent various letters to Emperor, Char Emperor Charles V stating that he would honor the crown and offer him the first spoils of gold and silver that they extracted from Mexico. And that was simply a political stunt to avoid being punished for his unlawful actions. <laughs> Overall, it is clear that the controversies that surround Cortez do not align with the glorifications that have been described of him. And he truly went rogue. And clearly his actions show that his main goal was to exploit the wealth that was in the Aztec empire to, to fulfill his own personal vendetta. So the second major aspect that I uh, decided to highlight in my argument was the entrance into the capital city of Tenochtitlan. Essentially from arriving on the shores of Veracruz in 1519, entering Tenochtitlan was Cortez's main goal to exploit the wealth from the Aztec Empire. Cortez knew that Montezuma's storehouses and religious, shri religious shrines were located in the city. And because he knew that, once he entered the city with his native allies, like the Sempaloans, which is another tribe that was within Mexico, there was no other way for the Aztecs to stop him from achieving his goal of exploiting wealth from the city. Essentially, once he entered the city of Tenochtitlan, Cortez knew that his success was 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 there he saw the light at the end of the tunnel montezuma cordially invited them to stay in the city and offered them a place to stay which aided in the spanish fascination of the aztec riches and 
by Montezuma doing this, many of the Aztec elites that were alongside Montezuma disagreed with Montez disagreed with him because they were worried of what would come from the Spanish residing in their city and living there with them. And while they were in the city, they located a room in Montezuma's father's house where he kept his royal collection of gold, jewels, crowns, and other royal valuables. And this is whenever they found all these valuables and gold and silver and all that, this proved to be a turning point in the conquest because from that point on, they were solely focused on locating and extracting the wealth and riches from the capital in order to bring wealth and power back to the crown. And while they were in the capital city, there's one major turn. There's another major turning point that occurred. And during their stay, they captured Montezuma and he remained in the Spanish captivity until his mysterious death. The captivity of, of Montezuma is significant to Cortez's exploitation and extraction of wealth simply because from that point on, Cortez and his men were in total control of the city and could almost do anything through deception, fear, terror, and oftentimes brute force. Another major, uh, or another major, major point that I decided to include with, within my argument is Montezuma's experiences. Being that he was the emperor of the Aztec Empire, he had a lot of encounters with Hernan Cortez, and his experiences really helped to understand what the deceptive nature of Cortez and how manipulative he really was. And essentially, in all of the in all of the accounts, especially from Bernal Diaz and Juan Juan Guinness de Sepulveda, Montezuma is the most criticized individual in the traditional accounts of the Spanish conquest. And he's criticized because it seemed, they make it seem like Cortez did not show any type of resistance in allowing the Spanish into his city. Yes, he was cordial when they first arrived, but the argument that he did not show any resistance just isn't factual. He initially told them that, that stories that they heard about the Aztec riches were lies, and he asked them to leave his city on multiple occasions throughout their stay. Cortez essentially did not respect him because he constantly was manipulating Montezuma to find out where his riches were from the time they met into Montezuma's capture and all the way up to his death. Montezuma kept the harmony between the gods and the civil government. He was not considered a god, but he was the leader of the Aztec Empire, and, his, and being that the religion was a cornerstone of Aztec society. It was Montezuma's job to make sure the civil government and the religious aspects of Aztec society were in harmony. And Cortez and his men were constantly trying to stop the religious practices of human sacrifice because of their Christian beliefs. But when they realized it was not gonna end, the Spanish's violent tendencies began to show and it translated into how they began to exploit their wealth from the Aztec empire because they began to start to use brute force to extract the wealth from the city. So another major aspect is the cultural destruction. I kind of touched on it a little bit, but oftentimes Cortez ordered his men to destroy everything in sight if the natives did not comply with him. For example, the Sempaloans, like I just mentioned previously, resided in Mexico, and when Cortez came across, came across them, he asked them to stop conducting human sacrifices. They refused repeatedly, and when Cort whenever they refused, Cortez simply ordered his men to tear down their religious idols and burn everything in sight to the ground. Essentially, the aspects of instilling Christian values by brute force transitioned into the extraction of wealth by brute force when they were made aware that the wealth was in the Aztec, when they were made aware of the Aztec Empire's wealth. And I guess it's kind of ironic because the this none of these actions really portray what Christianity really stands for, and I guess that's one that's one major thing that I highlighted within my paper, and it was a major point in my argument because yes, they were. It almost makes it seem like that they were using Christianity as kind of a cover up. They were using Christianity to kind of place it upon them and kind of mold their mold their Aztec society into a more Christian society. But in turn, 
none of their Christian values were being shown towards the natives. So it just was really something that I found troubling within my research. And according to Restall and Townsend, the natives viewing the Spanish as gods is an argument that is not rooted in fact. In uh, the Broken Spears, they, he touches on it, Portilla touches on this a little bit. And whenever the, whenever the Spanish arrived on the coast of Veracruz in 1519, there have been accounts throughout history that the natives viewed the Spanish's arrival as the return of the god Quetzalcoatl. And that's just, that argument itself is not rooted in fact. And essentially believing that the Aztecs saw the Spanish as gods aids in the argument that the natives were ignorant to what it meant to be human. And that's just not the case. And one of my and Camilla Townsend also states that the narrative that the natives believed that the Spanish were gods came about in the 1540s in an effort to allow the white man to feel remorseful for the pain and suffering that they inflicted upon the indigenous peoples. So another aspect that I've talked about within my argument of the extraction of wealth is Spanish dehumanization. Uh, the natives were also were often considered by the Spanish to be barbaric, subhuman, and whoops, whoops, hang on, dang. The natives were often considered by the Spanish to be barbaric, subhuman, and violent. And it is also reasonable to conclude. Uh, Juan Guinness de Sepulveda states that even full conversion and subjection to the Spanish Empire could only partially turn these barbarians into civilized men. And that's just one, that is one quote that I read throughout my research that really stood out to me and really, really showed that their Christian values were not the priority here. They, if their Christian values were, were the priority, they would have seen these individuals as human beings. And it was, a, it was a, their goal from the beginning to extract their wealth. It was not to spread Christianity among them. And if, they, if their actual goal was to spread Christianity among, among them, they would have humanized them and treated them better and treated them differently. Spanish superiority is also, Spanish superiority and native submission is also a major aspect of the, of the conquest of the Aztec Empire. Spanish superiority came from the Spanish's ha habit of winning that came all the way from the Reconquista on the Iberian Peninsula. And Cortes would often publicly torture the natives to set an example for others to comply with his orders. And this allowed for Cortes to gain a position of power over the natives. And this power directly relates to how he extracted the wealth from the Aztec Empire. And some conclusions that I gained from my research the Aztec Empire fell in 1521 to the Spanish. The empire fell to the Spanish after one last bloody conflict in Tenochtitlan between them and the natives. Even though the empire fell, some aspects of native culture remained, and most of the natives lived until the old world diseases set in and killed a majority of them off. And at the conclusion of my research, one question I kind of formulated myself kind of resonated with me and I talked to Dr. Sumner about it a lot. And it's what could have happened differently? What could have happened if the conquest happened differently? And essentially the answer isn't clear, but it would be reasonable, reasonable to conclude that if the Spanish had the desire to gradually mold their European way of life into what was already existent in Mexico, the history of the Aztec Empire would not have ended with the destruction of the most highly functioning native civilization in the world. Overall, even though the Spanish destroyed the Aztec Empire through the exploitation of wealth and disease, this was not a total cultural conquest because many indigenous traditions and practices continued after the empire fell in 1521. This is my bibliography. And do you have any questions? Woohoo! Leeson, that was great. Okay, questions for Leeson, please. Thank you. 
I'll jump in. Uh, I, th- I guess I, I liked uh, the way you talked about the when you dealt with the idea that um, there are different perspectives in terms of how th- these encounters took place. If you look at uh, Broken Spears and then the conquest of New Spain, right? This idea that um, Portilla, Leon Portilla in particular, is, is actually giving you the um, the perspective of Native peoples as opposed to the Spaniards. Can you talk a little bit about because you said that they did not view um, the Spaniards as gods, but can you talk a little bit about how they do describe those initial encounters? What is it that you see in terms of the uh, uh, the Aztec or the, the native peoples, how they view these, again, these alien peoples coming from, uh, from Spain at this encounter? Okay, so basically in most of the native accounts, how everything, how everything transpired, and it talks about it in the Broken Spears, so the story of the god Quetzalcoatl, he left in from Mexico into the Gulf whenever he'd made his departure. And the story of him was that he came back to the to Mexico, his homeland from the Gulf. And essentially, whenever the first encounters became came about, the Spaniards, Cortez and his men came in their ships from the Gulf. And that's why they had this, I guess they, whenever they saw that he came from the Gulf, they made the connection. And that's what, that's where all that came about. Um, is that kind of, is that kind of what you're asking? Like, well, the, so you mentioned how there's the, the myth, right? This idea that, um, that, that the people that the Aztec or the native people thought that, um, the Spaniards were gods, right? That this is not based in fact, in historical fact, yeah. as I think the way you said it. So just how did they actually, I mean, how did they actually see these people come when they first arrived? Mm-hmm. I mean, they were, they first, were fascinated. I mean, they were fascinated by, right? and, sa- and it was the same way with the Spanish too. The Spanish were fascinated with the, with the natives. The Aztecs weren't, they were basically they were amazed at the spanish ships they were amazed at the spanish's use of metal steel and their swords and their horses and right. even up even up to the uh, spanish's entrance into the empire that the aztecs had no the aztecs believed that the horse and the man were one they didn't know that they were two separate beings and that's and i read that in conquest of new spain once they figured out that the that the horse and the man were separate, then that's whenever they really truly understood that the Spanish really weren't gods, and mm-hmm. a lot of other things went into that as well. But they essentially the big the big picture is they were they were fascinated with the Spanish just as much as the Spanish were fascinated with them. Okay. Yeah. No, I I think that's important, right? The idea that they they're different, uh, but not not gods, right? That I think is yeah. way that uh, that you put it. Yeah. Well, and it's important to remember too, and Lisa and I have talked about this, that like Moctezuma in particular is such a fascinating figure here, right? Because the the person who's supposed to the the emperor died of smallpox, and so Moctezuma is his nephew, so he's in charge, and Moctezuma is is actually. The, the people who surround Moctezuma, the other Aztec elites, right, don't necessarily agree with Moctezuma's allowing Cortes to enter into the city. Mm-hmm. So, like, even the Aztec elite themselves do not agree on what should have gone down, right? Not to mention all the other indigenous peoples, all the other different groups who are either allies of the Aztecs or much more likely enemies of the Aztecs, right, who are like, Hey Spaniards, you are interested in you know the Aztec gold? Sure, we'll help you out. You know what I mean? So, Lisa, talk to me a little bit about what you read because the Broken Spears isn't just the Aztec account; it's the native account, yes. right? So, like you talked about the Sempoalans. What are some of the other important native groups here in the conquest? Well, you have the the Fox Collins as well, and I mean the the importance that, that comes from all these other native tribes was that the allies, the allies that they kind of made with Cortez to yeah. kind of in, to kind of go with his, I guess, with his following 
because they also re they also resented Montezuma as well. Yeah. Because Montezuma made them and all the other surrounding tribes pay tribute. And exactly. They they really resented Montezuma for that, and that's why whenever they realized that by Cortez coming, um, they wanted to join in Cortez in overtaking Montezuma. Um, so the Tlaxcalans Collins and the Simple Owens were some of the biggest ones that I read in my mm -hmm. in my research and the importance that i found from it is what they resent they resented montezuma just as much as cortez was in montezuma when they in the aztec empire or maybe even more so right because the majority yeah. of cortez's soldiers are other indigenous peoples not spaniards yeah. mm -hmm. and yet we call it the spanish conquest so it's actually much more of a civil war than anything yeah. else and yet we don't understand it that way you know Okay, other questions for Leeson? Yes, Leeson. Um, how far, you, your argument is that the that Cortez um, went after the Aztecs to get their gold. Mm -hmm. And um, is, is that an innovation by Cortez or is that uh, motivation got a longer history than Cortez that reaches back um, further, I believe it. I b truly believe that it reaches back further, um, and I I, be I believe that it was motivated by the the habit of winning that occurred from the um, the Reconquista and right. kind of the the I guess Spanish superiority of people who were not believed to be Christian. Is that if, if, you, if you're following me here so mm -hmm. i i truly believe that um cortez is that all of this stemmed from the spanish's belief that they were superior to the natives and that mm -hmm. the natives were not viewed as human and essentially they did all of this by saying that they were spreading Christianity, but really and truly they wanted, they heard about the wealth that the Aztec empire contained and they wanted to attain it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Sumner will be impressed to learn that I was reading a letter recently uh, by Columbus actually. And he re he's writing back to the Spanish ruler and he's basically saying, this is what we need to do. I don't remember the title of the letter, Dr. Sumner, you probably know it off the top of your head, but he's, I looked in vain for some lofty motivation. <laughs> it, all, it was all about, um, it was all about this much gold that we might be able to get and make sure you, you, you tax them at this rate and this and that and this and that. And so this seems to be, uh, I think you're correct. I think it does seem to have a longer um, life uh, shelf life than than just Cortez. He's picking up a thread that has already been um, set down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Other questions for Lisa. Hey, Piers, where are you at? Wake up. Good job, Lisa. Listen, I thought you did great. I didn't know Mexico ended with an A. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And the live stream continues. Hello, America. Hello, Presbyterian College community. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> More questions for Lisa. No, great uh, job. And I have to say, and Dr. Harris and Dr. Heiser would love for you to chime in, but you guys all did fantastic. Like, blew me away, all nine of you, with your ability to handle these extenuating circumstances. And you all gave really confident and really solid presentations today. So congratulations. You guys did awesome. And I'm not exaggerating. You know I wouldn't say that if I didn't mean it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I want to say this. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was worried, not because I didn't think you could do it, but I was worried about the extra burden of having to figure out how to do this online. Yeah. Uh, you guys all did a great job. Very, yeah. very pleased. Very pleased. Really did. 
really did a good job. Yay. And now you're done. That's right. <laughs> Go get a margarita home. in your own house with your family. <laughs> Yay. There, there you go. Yay. See y'all at home. I got a Corona. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you at Senor's. That's where we're supposed to be going right now. Senor's has <laughs> Corona. First round's on me. Womp womp. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, um, seniors, if you come back for homecoming, I owe you a drink. And juniors, God willing, when I see you next year, I owe you a drink. Thomas, is your beer already finished? Oh yeah, toast. Are you are you kidding me? A Corona, and a Corona, no less. <laughs> I am scared. <laughs> Oh my God. I didn't have a lime though, so that's pretty rough. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. <laughs> Corona light. Yeah, no, and I didn't even have a lime. Oh my God. Yeah, no, it's trash. That's why oh. I drink. No I bueno, Tomas. No bueno. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, everybody. Well, congratulations. You did it. You did an awesome job. And uh, go have a drink with your family or lock yourself in your room with the beverage of your choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Bye, everybody. What's up? Bye. You look cute. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm gonna, I better stop this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Oh.